Okay, um, I'm very, very pleased to have with us today Jacob T. Levy. Levy. Before we've had a debate about the pronunciation of his name, and he has cleared it up for us. Uh, before I say more about him, uh, I want to uh, thank Steve Sheffrin, head of the Murphy Institute and the Murphy Institute for sponsoring this series. This year there will be five total public lectures on a variety of subjects, some on moral psychology, some others in political theory. So uh, we'll, you can go to the Murphy website to find out all about this, especially the Center for Ethics and Public Affairs. So we want to thank the Murphy Institute for the support for these lectures. Okay, Professor Levy is the Tomlinson Professor of Political Theory and Coordinator of the Research Group on Constitutional Studies at McGill University. He holds research interests in multiculturalism, federalism, nationalism, pluralism, and the history of liberal thought. He is the author of two books, The Multiculturalism of Fear, published by Oxford in 2000, and Rationalism, Pluralism, and Freedom, published by Oxford just recently in 2014, as well as numerous articles in journals including the Political Theory, American Political Science Review, Nomos, and Social Philosophy and Policy. Uh, he did his PhD at Princeton and got an LLM from the University of Chicago Law School. And that's our little blurb on him, but let me just say, uh, it, I think that he's one of the most creative political theorists around, and he's also, uh, like the best political theorists, uh, able to say interesting things both about the history of political theory and about contemporary work. So uh, let's uh, thank him very much for coming today, and his talk is going to be on rationalism, pluralism, and freedom, which covers a lot of territory. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out, and thank you for having me. This is my first academic trip to Tulane uh, in my professional career. I'm very happy and excited to be here. My talk will be drawn from my recently published book of the same title. The book substantially mixes together themes from normative political theory and philosophy and themes from the history of political thought as well as a fair amount of social theory and social science. Most of the talks that I'm giving derived from the book emphasize the historical part of it, but in light of an invitation from an ethics center, I've aimed to offer some reflections on the actual normative themes of the book, though I can't guarantee that I won't from time to time throw in some Mill and Smith and Montesquieu, because that's just how I talk. There's a right to freedom of speech. The right to freedom of speech includes the right to false speech. It includes, for example, the right to publish a ghost-written book under one's own name. Indeed, in American history, it has sometimes included the right to receive a Pulitzer Prize for a book that was written by someone else but published under one's own name. All of this is covered as a matter of freedom of speech. Within a university, there is no right to submit written work that was written by someone else under your name. That will get you expelled if you are one kind of university person or fired if you're the other. There's a right to freedom of religion, which includes the freedom to, for example, denounce the teachings of Roman Catholicism about what happens during communion, a denunciation that was fundamental to the creation of the various Protestant denominations during the Reformation. There is not a right of religious freedom to attend Catholic communion, stand up, pronounce your denunciations, overturn the communion tray, tray spilling the wafers on the ground, and turn to the congregation denouncing the priest as the whore of Babylon, as Martin Luther liked to do. 
there's a right to use contraception and obtain abortions within a liberal political society governed by liberal norms about sexuality. There is not a right to remain a priest of the Roman Catholic Church while advocating, much less actually using contraception or ha supporting the procuring of or the provision of abortions. I have the right to decorate my house as I like and certainly I have the right to put religious decorations, religiously appropriate symbols on my house, in front of my house, unless I live in a condominium or homeowners association, the joining of which I entered into by signing an agreement about the collective determination over the physical public appearance, whether that means what gets put visible to the hallways in a condo association, such that my putting a mezuzah outside my door might be a violation of the condo association rules, or what I can put in the front yard if I'm in a homeowner's association, such that my building a sukkot in my front yard could be a violation. And as generation after generation of too clever for their own good 16 and 17 year olds have learned to their dismay, saying, it's a free country, carries little to no weight in arguments within the household. <laughs> there is a right to travel in a liberal society. There's a right to freedom of movement. That is utterly unexercisable against the curfew set by your parents or against the prohibitions on going on an out-of-town sleepover with friends of whom they don't approve. Rights of freedom of speech are likewise not exercisable within the household. That the Supreme Court says you have the constitutional right to wear a jacket with the motto F word, the draft on it, doesn't mean that if you wear it to the dinner table and you're told to take it off that you have any grounds for complaint. My book starts off trying to think about how we think about cases like these. There's a very straightforward, clear, intuitive sense, one that I'm going to argue doesn't get us very far, but an intuitive sense in which each of those things seems puzzling. And many people have often thought, at least one example at a time, that the moral reasons we have for caring about one or another right one or another capacity that we have the freedom or the guarantee of the ability to exercise within a liberal society. Those have to be things we care about because we care about the individual capacity to do those things. If I care about freedom of speech because I care about freedom of speech, then why should I care what the agency is standing in the way of my freedom of speech? If I care about the right of women to be equal, then why should I draw a distinction between a law that discriminates on the basis of sex and the rule of my religion that says women may not serve as clergy, women must wear clothing of one kind or another. That intuitive sense, as I said, I think doesn't get us very far, and I'm going to offer a fuller account of why. To a first approximation, what we do with our freedom is very often to organize sets of rules that we live by. A thing that I have a right to do, a thing I have a freedom to do, I also have a freedom to refrain from doing. What I do with my freedom isn't some one act, but a choice among acts. My right to wear the F the draft jean jacket is tied up with my right not to do so. And what I may do freely or refrain from doing freely, we may do freely or refrain from doing freely. 
What free people do with their freedom is organize, associate, and act together in all kinds of ways. And their organization and association and acting together in all kinds of ways involves a mutual acceptance of rules that amounts to a mutual refusal here among us while we are acting in this local capacity to use our general freedom in some particular way. We all have freedom of religion. We, ten people, have roughly the same views about religion. We agree that we are going to associate together, call ourselves by some religious name, and have the stuff of our agreement be binding on us. Insofar as you want to be a member of this club that we've formed, that gets together once a week and worships in the way that we've all agreed that we will worship, insofar as you want to stay in the club, you will continue to worship in the ways to which we've agreed. If you change your mind, you can leave. But you can't stay, protest the rules, and claim that the rules are a violation of your freedom of religion. The rules are our exercise of our freedom of religion in common. That is what freedom of association means. And freedom of association is organizationally, institutionally, how our freedoms are exercised most of the time in most of our life. We are constantly choosing not to do things that we have the right to do. This is a necessary truth. The range of things that we have the liberal freedom to do in a liberal society at any given moment of time is effectively infinite. Every choice we make, every action we take, and every agreement we enter into with our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, our co-religionists, or whatever, each of those is a waving for right now, for right here, of our freedom to do all the other things. And insofar as we have co projects in common, things that we want to do together, which is most of the time if we want our things to matter in a big, densely populated, complicated social world. Insofar as we want to do things together, we have the freedom to say together, let's do this, not that. And in saying so, we make doing that against our rules. Most of the rules that most of us come into contact with in most of our lives in a free society have this character. Whether you notice them or not, whether you're paying attention to them or not, in our associational lives, which takes up a lot more of our waking hours than your occasional contact with traffic court or family court or criminal court, in most of our lives we are subject to and more or less unthinkingly obey a huge range of rules of this kind. The impulse to look at them, or to look at one of them at a time, and say, that violates my freedom, gets tied up with a kind of category mistake. As if everything that we decide to do, or we decide to refrain from doing, is substantively the same as a state law mandating or prohibiting. We have to be able to choose and in choosing, we have to be able to exclude other choices. I'm going to wait until that finishes going by. And then it gets more complicated than that. Because in agreeing to have rules together, we very often also agree to have authority structures among us. Once the associations that we enter into, once the common enterprises that we choose to undertake, get 
more complicated than a certain very local, immediately interpersonal level, then we end up having to have someone who can decide when the rules have been kept and when they haven't. We have procedures to help us change the rules, interpret the rules, make new rules when necessary, and also to adjudicate when the rules have been violated and when they haven't been. Our waving of our freedom as against each other here and now will then routinely also say, and this one of us, this person, we're going to put in a position to make decisions. That means that we've created power. In the first instance, according to the way philosophers talk, what we've created isn't power but authority. We've agreed that among the ten of us who wish to worship in common, we're going to have one who is the keeper of doctrinal record someone who keeps the notes about what it is we agreed to in our weekly prayer meeting, what it is we've signed up for as our interpretation of the thing we do in church. Probably some procedure that would allow it to change over time. And there will be someone who, when push comes to shove, is able to say, you're not following the rules anymore. Now, the someone might be a majority. It could be that what we ten agree to is we will be governed democratically and whatever any six of us say in any given week goes. That's no less an authority structure than any other. It's a democratic authority structure. But if you're on the wrong end of it, then you notice the bite of the authority just as much as if we've declared a kind of monarchical priesthood. In creating authority we entrust to someone or some group of people the ability to make decisions even if they're not the decisions that we would have reached. Why? Well because we care about the common enterprise. We care about the thing that we've associated for the sake of. Our shared religious views, our shared interest in scouting, our shared interest in having a university that organizes the production and the dissemination of knowledge, our shared reasons for creating a homeowners association that will give our neighborhood a certain character or whatever. And we understand that the common enterprise, the associational life, can't endure if we all have to be in unanimous agreement about everything all the time. There has to be some way to give institutional life to the rules that we mean to live by together. That institutional life is authority. If it were the case that we had any way to organize authority in human affairs such that the person who held authority only ever exercised it for the sake of their best interpretation of the common enterprise, if it were the case that, say, when you elect a condo board president, or when you appoint a priest, or when you allow the democratic majority to run your club, if it were the case that all of those decisions would be made seamlessly in line with what all of us wanted to do in creating the association and its rules in the first place, then we wouldn't have a power problem. But none of that's the case, and we do have a power problem. We create authority structures for our reasons, for the same reasons that we entered into associational life in the first place. But in creating authority structures, we entrust decision-making ability to some person or some set of persons, governing according to some procedures, but still person or persons. And those person or persons have reasons of their own. When you appoint a priest, even if you belong to a religion that holds that the appointment of priests is divinely guided, that God directly 
spiritually intervenes to ensure that only people of a certain kind of character become priests. It's still the case that you have given a flesh and blood person relevant authority over their congregation. That's not a bad thing to do. We did it because we meant to worship in common. We mean for our religious doctrine to have content. We mean for our sense of the norms that God wants us to live by to have some meaning in the world. Therefore, we do things to enforce it. But then there's still this flesh and blood person. The flesh and blood person is prone to temptation, is selfish, is power hungry, is, in short, prone to all of the flaws that all of us are all the time. And whether in one big wave of abuse or just bit by bit by coming to enjoy their status, using their authority in ways that tend to elevate their status, diminish the status of others, one way or the other, the authority holder has the capacity to exercise power over us that isn't in our interest. That wasn't what we meant to be signing up for when we created associational life in the first place. This is one of the key reasons why I think the answer to the questions around freedom and associational rules, freedom and associational life, is not only, simply, whatever I'm free to do, we're free to do, whatever I'm free to refrain from doing, we're free to refrain from doing. All of that is the beginning of the answer, but it's not the end. Now, the name for that beginning of an answer is freedom of association. To say freedom of association is to say we have the freedom to create organizations, relatively formal, relatively informal, highly bureaucratic and institutionalized like a university, highly disaggregated and local like a religious enthusiastic movement in the mid-19th century, whatever. We have the ability to do things together that will give us rules. And if the rules mandate things that we'd be free to do, as private persons, then the rules are legitimate. And if the rules prohibit things that we would be free to refrain from doing as private persons, then the rules are legitimate. What work are those provisos doing? Those provisos are getting rid of the all too familiar cases from freshman year debates about freedom of religion that say, well, does my freedom of religion include my freedom to engage in human sacrifice? Well, no. Because you as a private person didn't have the freedom to engage in human sacrifice. We call that murder. And so the fact that 10 of you get together and say, our rules demand that we commit murder, that's not part of the theory of freedom of association or the theory of religious liberty that is generated out of freedom of association. Likewise, uh, the freedom must not extend our associational freedom must not extend to prohibiting things that is mandatory for us to do as private persons. As, pri as members of a religious organization, do we have the rights to enslave our children? No. There's an affirmative obligation on the part of parents to do things to provide for the basic capacity of their children. The extent of that is prone to a great deal of debate, but you must do things to enable your, childhood to become, your child to become a functional human being. You must not lock your child in a closet, deprive them of human speech and communication. You must not treat them like an animal. You must not. And the things that you must not do, your group cannot then demand. But within those boundaries, freedom of association says, if I'm free to do it, we're free to have a rule demanding it. And if I'm free to refuse to do it, we're free to have a rule prohibiting it. If that sounds too blasé to be interesting and controversial, then I'll draw attention to the amount of controversy in the political world in democratic societies about the wearing of various kinds of Islamic religious clothing 
by religiously believing Muslim women. I have the freedom as a private person to choose what to wear within only the boundary in most democratic societies is a background rule that uh, I am prohibited from going around completely naked. But I'm free to cover myself completely. In Quebec, where I live these days, indeed, five months of a year, I'd better cover myself completely. <laughs> it's funny, and yet, Quebec is one of the societies that has had really serious political contention over whether a Muslim woman can go around with her face covered. There's genuine contention about even whether she can go around with her hair covered. But certainly, can she go around with her face covered? This is something that riles up Quebec politics and French politics and Dutch politics. And if you poke too hard at certain parts of American politics, American politics. This even though if you go out on the streets of Montreal in December or January, you can't see anybody's faces. What I have the freedom to refrain from doing, I've, I'm free to refrain from showing my face. But, goes this political movement, I'm not free to refrain from showing my face if I'm refraining from showing my face for a religious reason. Because we disapprove of the message that you're covering your face for that reason seems to convey. The argument I've offered for the shape of freedom of association and the religious liberty that comes from freedom of association is interestingly controversial insofar as it rules that out. It says, if I'm free to wear a hat, I'm free to wear a yarmulke. If I'm free to wear a ski mask, I'm free to wear a niqab. And the fact that the religiously oriented clothing seems to be something like a rule a rule of our religious group rather than my free choice when I wake up in the day, that doesn't matter. Because I'm free to refrain from showing my head. I'm free to refrain from showing my face. And the addition of the religious reasons must not make me less free to do those things. And yet, and yet freedom of association isn't the whole story. And one of the reasons why it's not the whole story is that authority generates power. Our associational and organizational lives require us to sign up for procedures and agree to governing officials that are then prone to abuse. At one extreme, think of the case of the association for now I won't give the association a name, of the association that doesn't have any rules at all, except we do what that guy says. Now, I'm free to do what that guy says. I'm free to take advice. I'm free to walk down the street and say, which direction do you think I should go? And ask it of a stranger and just go the direction the stranger dictates. It would be strange behavior but it's not illegal or immoral behavior. I'm free to have a trusted best friend whose advice I always take. I'm free to enter into the kind of marriage where I think, well, my wife knows better than I do about pretty much every matter of daily life, and so when it comes to what to do in the house and what to wear and how to drive, I'm just going to completely sign over my judgment and constantly take this. I'm free to do those things. Am I free to say, I'm always going to do what that guy says? And by the way, let's the 10 of us all do whatever that guy says. Where that guy never gives us rules. He just gives us commands. One day commands like this, the next day commands like that. Well, it's a borderline case, and we call it by a borderline word, which is cult. The word cult is a dangerous word in discussions of religion and religious liberty. It is very prone to a certain kind of irregular noun conjugation. I have a religion, you have a denomination, he has a sect, and they have a cult. And 
most of the religious denominations and congregations that we know of in a religiously pluralistic society have been called cults at one time or another in some part of religious debate. It is routine for those outside a religion to look at a religion and say, you people have signed over your freedom. You people have forsaken your wills. You're just blindly obeying. Whether it's that you're blindly obeying the priest, you're blindly obeying a book that was written thousands of years ago, you're blindly obeying the voices in your head that you take to be the voice of God. This is a standard line of criticism. And in using the cult as a borderline case, I don't mean to be endorsing the description of actually existing religions as cults. But as a model, the idea of an association that we join, the only rule of which is we all agree to do whatever that guy says. It strains the limit of our sense that we enter into associational life for reasons and for purposes and to pursue projects in common together. The other cases I've talked about about authority structures, they are trying to interpret the purposes that we all said we had in common. In the cult case, we never say the thing that we have in common. If the cult leader wants to wake up one day and be an evangelical Baptist, the next day and be an ultra-Orthodox Jew, the day after that and be a Richard Dawkins New Atheist, according to the rule that we've set up, we follow him in each of those things. That's a strange thing to imagine people choosing to do, and it's hard to describe what our purposes are together in agreeing to follow that rule. Instead, what we think of when we say a situation like that is sheer power. We use words like brainwashing to express what's going on in that power structure. And we have doubts that the people who are subject to that kind of power are really still wholly free people. That that's a polar extreme case and not something that we encounter in normal daily life doesn't mean that the lesson it teaches is limited to that extreme case. The more law-like the rules according to which we live, the less it looks like the cult case, and maybe the more constrained the power that starts to concentrate in the hands of the authority figure. Maybe the more constrained the power. But maybe not. Because legal interpretation is its own kind of authority that generates its own kind of power. And the Catholic Church is an extremely legally rich religious tradition with more than a thousand years of continuously existing legal tradition inside the church and an understanding within church doctrine that part of what justifies the hierarchical governance structure of the church is the need to have authoritative interpretations of canon law. The Catholic Church is very much like a legal code and legal system. But we know enough about the history of Catholicism to say this is fully compatible with the priests, the bishops, the archbishops, and the pope sometimes finding that being at the top of the legal interpretive structure that's a great deal of power in their hands to do things for their reasons, not for our reasons, even if, if supposing that we are the Catholic congregation. Even knowing that, we have reason to have priests and all the rest because that's our religious doctrine. But the flesh and blood people can make use of the legal traditions and of their authority to issue final legal judgments for their own benefit and for the benefit of the institution and its hierarchy rather than the benefit of the members. As long as that's a possibility, then the pure freedom of association argument can't go all the way through because the reason for having radical freedom of association is our freedom to pursue our projects in common. It's not to subject ourselves to someone else's arbitrary will. 
The power is an intrusion onto our purposes. It's someone else inflicting their purposes onto us. If the religious cases are hard to wrap one's mind around, then go to some of the much more mundane cases. One of my favorites is the case of the Condo Board Association. With apologies to anyone here who has actually served in such an office, it is, I think, a widely endorsed stereotype for good reason that the people who think it's worth their time, and it's a lot of time, the people who think it's worth their time to spend night after night after night in committee meetings and drafting bylaws and walking around their neighbors' houses inspecting whether their neighbors are obeying every part of the condo board, of the condominium agreement. Those tend to be obnoxious, nosy neighbors who really like having power. They tend to be people who are seeking out the position precisely because they like telling other people what to do. This is, I think, unavoidable and structural. We have reason when we enter into a condo agreement, we have reason to want there to be a common governance structure. That's what distinguishes a condominium from just a random assemblage of rooms that each of us owns in the same building. In wanting there to be rules, we want there to be the ability for the rules to be enforced. But the governance structure is always going to select for the people who think that that's a good way to spend their time. And those will be people who like to exercise every part of the authority they've been given to the advantage of their own ability to tell their neighbors what to do. That is unavoidable means it's not a reason to abolish condominium associations. It's not a reason to start to say, no, my freedom as a property owner trumps your ability to tell me what to do. But it is a reason to notice that there's something more going on than only associational freedom in these cases. And then to start to pay attention in an empirical way, case by case, to how much power is being exercised. In whose interest is power being exercised? Can the power be effectively checked internally? These are something more like sociological questions than they are like philosophical questions. They're not to be answered only by saying, well, we pooled our rights. That's what we did when we created the association. They require some attention to what the governance structures actually do in particular circumstances. There's another set of reasons, besides authority generating power, that I think push against the radical freedom of association answer to the problem of freedom in institutional life. And that's that pluralism generates power. It's a commonplace in talking about associations and civil society to say, well, as long as I have the freedom to leave, that is, as long as there are lots of religions, so there are lo as long as there are lots of associations, lots of neighborhoods, that limits the amount of power that can be exercised over me because I can always run away. I can always leave. And that is one part of the truth. Whether it's the more important part of the truth is going to depend on a whole range of contextual, sociological, and political kinds of questions. One easy set of examples to get your intuition going in the right direction. When you have an incoming ethnic majority, say you have an invading imperial power that has taken over a territory and surrounded a pre-existing local group. The first person in the now minority, the first person in the subordinate group to learn the imperial power's language, thereby gains a tremendous amount of power over the members of their own group that they didn't have before the majority showed up. Because they're the ones who can always go back to the community and say, 
we've got to give them, we've got to give them 10% of our produce, of which I'll keep 10% as my finder's fee, uh, or else they're going to exterminate us. How do we know? Well, we have no one to trust but you. The locally dominant interpreter, the locally dominant intermediary in a more general way, the one who can serve as the go-between, between our group and the outside forces, can say to our group, you have to do things the way that I'm describing, or else I'm not going to be able to keep the outsiders at bay anymore. Now, there are good reasons for us to go along with this. In many medieval and early modern multi-ethnic and multi-religious cities, you would have significant ghetto organizations of city life. And this was true not only of Jewish ghettos in Europe, but also true of the Jewish and Christian ghettos under, for example, the Ottoman Empire. And what do the authorities in a city like that like to have? They like to have one person they can talk to, who will, th who, whom they will hold responsible for keeping their community in line. We have no interest in policing your ghetto. We have no interest in setting our police running through your streets. We have no interest in trying to understand your language or your ways. Just keep everything under control for us, and it'll be fine. But the person they pick as the one to talk to, whether that's someone who had some genuine office in the old days that's now been elevated to a kind of power the office never had before. I was the neighborhood rabbi. Now I'm kind of the effective lord commander of the ghetto because, well, I'm the only one who the city authorities will talk to. This, by the way, was endemic during European imperialism in the Americas and in Africa, where the European imperial powers would find someone who held some genuine local office and say, ah, you must be the chief. In virtue of being the chief, we're going to treat you like a king, which means we expect you to rule over your own people, or else they're going to be a problem for us and we'll have to intervene. And then the person who had some customary authority goes back and says, guess what, now I'm the chief, and now I have power. Again, these limit cases only illustrate the problem, they don't exhaust the problem. There are ways in which pluralistic settings, because they generate the need for one community to talk to another, and for boundaries to be set among them, and for the peace to be kept between them, they give the authority structure within one of those communities more power than it would have had in a non-pluralistic world. We've added an exit option, and that's one check on power. We've also significantly enhanced how hierarchical the organizational life is of those of us who stay inside the community. One answer that people offer in the face of all of this, in the face of worries about the power that is created in associational life, is say, well, now we've identified the right role for the state. The state's job in a liberal society is to stop our rights from being violated. And all right, you successfully explained to me that it's not a violation of freedom of speech to expel me from plagiarism. It's not a violation of freedom of religion that I can't overturn the communion tray. But there is a reason in freedom to care about power within these groups. And therefore, the right job for the liberal state is to intervene in group life so as to prevent unfair accumulations of power. That won't do either. I've been talking about sociological tendencies of group life, ways that things tend to go because of what happens when you put a lot of different interactions together, whether those are intra-communal interactions or inter-communal interactions. And the way that they go together exceeds just what we would have wanted. 
Therefore, you can't reduce group life to just being the expression of all of our free choices stacked up together. There are organizational dynamics that take over at the higher social level that aren't just reducible to adding up lots of individual free choices. The same is true, the same is indeed even more true, of states. States are not machines for the dispensing of justice. No matter how often one sees a description in political philosophy that says, the purpose of states is to protect rights. That's not the function of states. States are organizations in society and they have organizational dynamics all their own. The state, by the way, is not all kinds of political organization. The state is a distinctive kind of political organization characteristic of European modernity, which has then spread over the world over the last couple of centuries. But it's a distinctive kind of political organization in its claim to supremacy and exclusivity in language that some of you will have encountered in your classes, in its claim to exercise a monopoly on the legitimate use of force within a well-defined territory. This is uh, Max Weber's definition of the modern state. The state has an organizational drive toward monopoly and exclusivity. And that gives state actors and state officials a strong recurring reason to be suspicious of rival claimants to authority on their territory. States don't like intermediate organizations. To a first approximation, they view churches, universities, clubs, associations as rival sources of norms that seek to take up more of our lives than state law and shared state citizenship seeks to take up. This is easy to see in the case of ethnic and cultural minority groups. States have an urge to become nation states, to suppress minority languages because minority languages are a way for people to keep secrets from the state. But it's also been importantly true of religions that claim significant autonomy from the state. The state will expropriate the church's goods. It will prohibit monastic practices. It will send the Union Army to the outskirts of Utah and say, wouldn't you like to abolish polygamy now? States are suspicious of rival claimants to normative authority within their boundaries. They're suspicious because those rival claimants accumulate wealth that the state likes to expropriate. And this is one of the oldest stories of associational life that the King of France looks at the Knights Templar and says, nice set of wealth you've accumulated there as the bank of the Mediterranean. Uh, we'd like to have it now, therefore we're going to execute all of you for blasphemy and heresy and sodomy uh, and seize all of the gold in your vaults. One state after another does this to the Jews. One state after another in early modernity does this to the Catholic Church as part of the turn to Protestantism that just so happens to enrich the state. They don't like the wealth that accumulates. They don't like the secrecy. States, among other things, are censusing and taxing and conscripting agencies. And anything that makes it possible to hide in society makes states nervous. They don't like that associational life is routinely transnational. My ethnic or religious identity gives me fellow members in other states. My associational life gives me fellow members in other states, whether that's the Masons or the Political Science Association or the World Soccer Federation. It creates ties directly to people in other places and, well, states like to have exclusive claims on our loyalty. And so when you say to a state, you ought to intervene to make sure that groups respect the freedom of their members in just the right way, to just the right extent, that is exactly as impotent as saying to the intermediate groups, 
you ought to have authority structures that express the common purposes of the members and don't aid the power of the officials. That's not what organizational life is like. Accordingly, there are patterns of bad behavior, patterns of behavior that jeopardize our freedom as people who inhabit states and inhabit group life. And if we care about a fully worked out sense of what it is to be a free person, able to make choices, able to pursue enterprises in common, able to be free from arbitrary local power and from unjust state intervention, then we need to keep both in mind at the same time. Central claim of my book is that it's very difficult to keep both in, in mind at the same time. Since what I've offered are rival sociological and psychological patterns, not rival stories about what rights we have or rival theories of what freedom consists of, that we could just pick one of and say, here's the right one. We can be and routinely are in the situation that both sets of suspicion are justified simultaneously. States really do invade our freedom, and they especially invade our freedom in our associational lives. And groups really do accumulate in-group power and restrict us from living our lives, even as we had wished to live them in our associational moment, to say nothing of limiting the freedom of those who are then born into the association in generations after the founding. A great deal of the book is devoted to a history of liberal political thought. And in that history of liberal thought, I argue that the leading political theorists within the liberal tradition of the past several centuries, over and over again, were able to see one set of dangers and not the other. John Stuart Mill was famously the liberal political theorist who was first to see that the Victorian patriarchal family was a site of tyranny and despotism. That to say legally, the husband and father is the only legal person in the household, that a wife has no independent legal capacity to choose differently from what her husband chooses, and children have no ability as legal persons to choose differently from how their fathers choose, that this was incompatible with human freedom. This assumed a superhuman level of generosity, virtue, and wisdom on the part of husbands and fathers, when in fact they're flesh and blood people who are prone to abuse authority in the interest of their own power. Mill got the family right. Mill got the family right for reasons that ran deep into his theoretical and philosophical understanding of the world. He wrote, in an essay on centralization. Any despotism is preferable to local despotism. If we are to be ridden over by authority, if our affairs are to be managed for us at the pleasure of other people, heaven forfend that it should be at that of our nearest neighbors. And he wrote this in the course of an essay about the emergence of centralized state power in Europe. That is to say, in part, a history of the emergence of the absolute monarchs of the early modern era, the despotic kings like Louis XIV. And Mill looks at Louis XIV and says he was very much better for the peasantry than the nobles over the local territory he replaced. And in Victorian England, rule by a technocratic elite in London will be very much better than neighborhood rule by all of your neighborhood busybodies who are far too interested in telling you morally what to do with your lives, whom to marry, how to raise your children, and so on and so on. Distant power is likely to be disinterested power. It won't seek to reduce you to subservience, and it won't try to put its nose into your business all the time. There were things that that insight allowed Mill to see including about the family. 
But Mill's friend and contemporary, John, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote in Democracy in America that the key to understanding American freedom was the American mastery of the art of association. In a mass democratic age, Americans had learned how to do things by doing things voluntarily together. And that was going to keep the Americans free from the despotism of an overweening centralized state, if anything would. Tocqueville wasn't sure that anything would in the long term, but if anything would, it would be in part that, Americans' ability to join together locally and do things in groups. Mill was a fan of democracy in America. He said, democracy in America taught me very many important things that changed my mind. And among the things that he thought he learned were the dangers of centralization and the value of associations. What's the value of association that he took away? Associations are very good little local pretend democracies where the central state will dole out a little bit of power to be exercised locally, where we will learn what it's like to vote and we'll learn what it's like to debate and we'll have our little play-acting democracy that will allow us to someday grow up and be well-educated, intelligent voters who on Mill's system of weighted voting uh, are the ones who get the disproportionate share of votes because the better educated you are, the more intellectually capable you are, the more votes you get on Mill's democratic theory. Mill couldn't see associations as expressing the purposes of their members. He was willing only to see them as instruments of the state to be used in some tutelary capacity that would allow us to grow up and be like the central state wanted us to be. And this misunderstanding of what Tocqueville had understood in Democracy in America meant that when Tocqueville later wrote The Ancien Regime and the Revolution, his history of freedom in France in the 18th and 19th centuries. And he said, under the Ancien Regime, when we had all of these privileged groups with different rights, when we had the Guild of Lawyers and when we had the self-governing cities with immunity from taxation, and when we had the nobility that had its morally indefensible separate privileges, we as a French people were freer because we cared about those intermediate bodies. Corps intermediaire is literally the key French phrase. Those intermediate bodies. And we would defend their rights. Even when those rights weren't themselves defensible, the very activity of defending our rights meant that we were constantly keeping a close legal constitutional eye on what the centralized state, which then meant the king, did. And therefore, we were capable of having a constitutionally limited state in a way that we aren't now in the 19th century. And because Mill hadn't understood what was going on in democracy in America in the first place, he's just at a loss when he reads Ancien Regime and the Revolution. He more or less throws up his hands and says, I don't understand what you think you're talking about here. Obviously, centralization has been an unalloyed good for human freedom. And, by the way, Mill is also unable to see that when Britain goes out and does something like colonize India, that that might be bad for the freedom of the people being governed. If being governed by smart people at the center who will free us from all of our nosy neighbors and our local superstitions and our backward beliefs, if that's good for our freedom because it frees us from local power, well then, so much the better if the central power is on a different continent because it will have no interest in shoring up Hindu traditions. It will have no interest in shoring up the power of the father or the husband in Indian households. So surely the way to liberate India is by imperialistically conquering it. The things that let Mill see the family clearly blinded him to associational life, to the ability of intermediate bodies to check the state, and to the problems of imperialism. But Tocqueville's not off the hook either. Tocqueville, having seen things that were important and true in associational life in America, also wrote about the family in America. 
And the family in America, the family in Second Great Awakening, very Protestant, very religiously dedicated, and very, in the 19th century, small r sense of Republican in orientation. Those family structures were much more conservative than family structures in France. The sexual and social limitations on women's lives were much more dramatic within a household. There were other compensating effects in American life. Uh, women did have some increased ability to exit very bad families because of the openness of the frontier, and many of them did so. Even when divorce was prohibited, women had some genuine just physical ability to leave their husbands and go set up out west and have their marriage disappear into the ether. But within one household, fathers and husbands were much stronger and the restrictions on women's lives were much tighter than was the case in middle or upper middle class life in France. And Tocqueville looked at this and says, what tremendous freedom. What tremendous freedom to voluntarily be subservient. How wonderful it is in American life that women are so free that they exercise all of their freedom all of the time by bowing their heads to their husbands. He observes family life that is probably comparably conservative to the family life that so horrified Mill in Victorian England, maybe even a little worse. And what he sees is women exercising their freedom all the time. Why? Well, Tocqueville was a keen observer of the value for freedom of our local things that we do together. And his ability to see that associations were like that, and that guilds were like that, and that the nobility was even like that. His ability to certainly see that church life was like that meant that he couldn't see that family life wasn't. One more example from the same era before I wrap up. Mill also wrote, in defense of the emerging European democratic nation state. Nationalism was a live question in Mill's time, and a great deal of that question had to do with the possible breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. Should the whole southeast of Europe become a whole lot of separate nation states, one for the Czechs, one for the Slovaks, one for the Serbs, one for the Greeks, one for the Bulgarians, or should it continue as being substantially two big multinational empires, one ruled from Vienna and Budapest and one ruled from Istanbul. And Mill thought it was clearly to the advantage of freedom that the big multinational empires be broken up into democratic nation states in which, because we all speak the same language, we'll be able to conduct genuine democratic debate together. And we won't be afraid of each other. And in not being afraid of each other, we'll be able to live peacefully, and we won't be able to be divided against each other by the state. Mill's contemporary Lord Acton wrote a response to Mill's argument about nationalism. And he said, when the nation is the state, it infuses our sense of belonging to the state with a tremendous degree of fervor. Just like used to be the case if the state and the church were the same thing. We would be too devoted to our political identity. We'd be too willing to do whatever the state asked of us because we thought the state and the care of our souls were the same enterprise. If we think that fellow citizenship and the ethno-cultural people that is our true community in the world, if those are the same thing, then my ability to politically dissent is radically attenuated. My disagreement becomes a kind of treason. I'm at odds with my brothers. I'm violating ties of blood and family. There will be an attachment, says Acton, to the nation state that is incompatible with freedom and that is radically incompatible with the freedom of the local minorities that are still going to exist after all of your would-be democratic nation states come into existence. And here, with the evidence of the hindsight of the 20th century and what happened to the world that was left behind by the breakup of the 
Habsburg and Ottoman empires, it clearly looks in retrospect like Acton's right. The democratic nation states, especially of the interwar period, were prone to a tremendous amount of illiberal ethnic chauvinism and were able to stir up a kind of devotion in nationalist sentiment among their populations that made political dissent deeply difficult. And this is one of the ideological roots of what becomes fascism in Italy and its sister movements in southeastern Europe. By contrast, Acton had said, the existence of many nations within one state, like the existence of many religions within one state, is both the evidence of and the guarantor of freedom. Because when we have many national ethnic groups within a state, no one of us is going to let the state get away with everything. We all understand that our political membership doesn't mean everything, and the state is not the only thing that matters to us. Acton was deeply insightful, I think, about the dangers of the emerging centralized model of the nation state in Europe, and he was one of the most insightful fans of federalism in the liberal tradition. He thought that what would keep things free in the multinational empires was that they would be federated. Therefore, there would not be excessive deference to the center. And he thought that the Americans had made a tremendous discovery for the sake of the future of human freedom in the federalism of the 1787 Constitution. And if he got things right, he also got things wrong. After the end of the American Civil War, he entered into a correspondence with Robert E. Lee that was obsequious in its flattery and deference to Lee. Lord Acton, who is a member of the British House of Lords, a member of the British establishment with qualifications that run all the way down into British society. Lord Acton says to Robert E. Lee, I mourn more for the stake which was lost at Richmond than I celebrate that which was preserved at Waterloo. That is to say, it makes me sadder that the South won the civil, lost the Civil War that it makes me happy that Britain won the Napoleonic Wars. For a 19th century member of the British establishment, this is an astonishing thing to say. Why does Acton say all of this? Not because he thought slavery was justifiable. He said before, during, and after the American Civil War that slavery was an evil. But he thought the real guarantor of freedom in modern society is going to be a division of institutional power that gives a great deal of governing authority to local bodies in a federated constitution. And he thought that so strongly that he couldn't bring himself to care very much about slavery. And so even when Robert E. Lee would write back and defend Southern resistance to Reconstruction, openly say, as far as I'm concerned, the right outcome of the Civil War is now we're all one big happy union again, and we Southern whites get to rule over blacks within the South. And isn't it terrible that they're not letting us do that? Acton just wouldn't acknowledge that anything had been said in his next reply. He couldn't bring himself to be interested in the kind of racial tyranny and hierarchy that was characteristic of antebellum and then Jim Crow Southern life. All that mattered was federalism. Now, I don't say all of these things about Mill, Tocqueville, and Acton in order to claim the supremacy of hindsight. It's a bad move in reading great old books to say, aha, but I would know better. I think that I can express judgments such that Mill was right about the family, and Tocqueville was right about associations, and Acton was right about nationalism and wrong about slavery. But that doesn't mean that any of them were foolish or stupid. It means instead that the theoretical insights that allowed them to see some things really well were also blinders. You can focus right in front of you where you're looking, and that makes it harder to see out of the corner of your eye. 
if your theoretical model of human freedom in society is dominated by a concern about local group power and about the tyranny that can be exercised by your near neighbors, by the people who know you and want to see you bow and scrape, or who want the joy of running your life, if that's your concern, it will be hard for you to see the ways in which a state threatens freedom, and vice versa. If your concern is with generating a thick intermediate associational life that can help keep the state in check, then over and over again you're going to underestimate the threat to freedom that those groups pose themselves. And even if you think you're keeping track of them, it's going to be the case that the things you do as a policymaker, as a lawmaker, to mitigate one of those worries aggravates the other. Part of what we do with intermediate groups, local levels of government, religious groups, ethno-national minorities, and so on, in order to protect the freedom of their members is to give them special political power to help stop the state from intervening. But then they have additional power. And the very thing that we've done in order to protect the freedom of their members from one threat enhances it from the other direction. This, I suggest, is something inescapable. If we had a full theory of what it is to be free in a complicated pluralistic society, then it would pay full attention to both simultaneously, and I think that that's what we can't have. The lesson to draw from that is not to abandon either of the thoughts. And my own account of freedom and associational life tends to be robustly on the pluralistic side. In most disputes that are at stake in contemporary politics and law, I think associations and local groups ought to have the freedom to live according to their own rules and norms and ways of life. But in saying that, I shouldn't ever elevate that to the status of a doctrine or a dogma. I shouldn't ignore the threats to freedom that are going to emerge locally. And I should accept that I'm never going to have one master theory that gets all the answers right all the time in all the places. Sociologically, that's not what power is like. We're going to move power around from one place to another and hope that a balance emerges, allowing freedom in the spaces in between. But we don't eliminate power over human lives. And the defense of freedom is therefore an ongoing balancing act not something to be intellectually or philosophically dissolved. Thank you.